ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning into the show. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of Special Projects at The Block, and I'm very excited to have joining us on the other side of the mic, Tina and Eric, to talk about Venice. I'm... Hi. Yeah, thanks for coming thanks on. Thanks for having us. I mean, obviously, I guess, you know, most people probably saw the announcement of you guys coming together to launch this. Um, let's start with the vision. What what inspired you to, you know, dive into probably the weird, unpredictable intersection of AI and crypto? Well, I was using a lot of AI services just kind of as a hobbyist, thinking they were cool, making images with MidJourney, playing around with ChatGPT, finding this stuff to be very interesting and powerful. Um, and then I started getting like a little concerned because, uh, to the degree that like, this is, these services are centralized, um, you can actually end up in a situation where like intelligence gets controlled, um, by a single company, by a government above it or both. And so that was increasingly worrying. And like, of course I come from the crypto world where we, love decentralization and permissionless systems and open source. Uh, and so I wondered like, um, maybe, maybe some of those principles could be applied in the, in the AI world, but I didn't know, you know, anything about how it worked. Uh, so then I, I started learning about like open source AI and what, what models were and like that actually some of these open source models were quite good and they were accelerating rapidly and, um, realized that like you could actually build an app that resembled chat GPT, but was permissionless, uncensored, private. And, um, I realized like no one had done that yet and it absolutely was needed for the world. So, uh, for the first time since I learned about Bitcoin in 2011, I thought maybe I should like put my toe outside of the, the crypto world for a minute and, um, really pay attention to this. So that, that was kind of where, where Venice came from. And, um, yeah, we, we launched back in, uh, in May and now we're just trying to build it as fast as we can. Does that resonate with you, Tina? I mean, this sort of, you know, there's something about AI that's captured the zeitgeist in a similar way to Bitcoin, but it seems more scary than crypto in some way. Is it? That's so interesting. What do you reckon? Yeah. Um, I have a slightly different view in that I think when you're trying to get people to adopt technology, um, crypto is, in my opinion, so much easier to explain because people understand how they spend money and they understand how they move money around, right? I mean, maybe they don't understand the mechanics of it, but but they know that they have to pay people and get paid, right? Um, and so trying to teach somebody about a new mechanism to be able to transact um, while technologically, I think we've not done a good job of, of kind of focusing on the technology instead of focusing on the use cases that basically help people understand how this, this um, new form of, of currency is important. But with AI, it's materially new, right? So um, I was not afraid of it. I was definitely more intrigued by it. I think the idea of, um, when I first learned about crypto of, you know, like magical internet money that lived in my computer and I could spend it and I could buy this money and I could use it later was far more scary to me mm. than, um, interacting with this artificial intelligence or, or machine learning that was, you know, manipulatable in a way that I could use it for my own benefit. So yeah, I had a different experience. Interesting perspective. I told, let's break down what you're saying. Cause it's interesting. Um, using crypto today is probably an order of magnitude more scary than using like open AI or, uh, some form of generative AI because it's fun. You know, you take a picture of your fridge and you spit it into the AI and it tells you like what you can make for dinner that night. Um, whereas I don't know, most listeners here are probably bridged or, you know, tried to move assets between wallets and uh, have experienced the the heart palpitations that that come with with that type of experience. 
But I think more so what's scary is not the future of, when you think about the future of crypto versus the future of AI, uh, the, the latter um, is seems more scary. I was just actually getting a haircut like right before we started recording. And my barber was telling me about his son, who's a um, animator in California. And, um, you know, obviously there were all the strikes, uh, I think it was early this year or last year, um, around AI. And it was just funny hearing a, a 60 some odd year old man talk about, uh, you know, what, what 2030, 2040 looks like where we have AI overlords. We're not going to have crypto overlords, right? Well, I don't know. I mean, Terminator, uh, Terminator didn't involve like a evil robot trying to sell you like a meme coin. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. But I think we could have this situation where we have a number of smart agents that do things autonomously and they'll use crypto for that and they'll use AI for that. Um, I mean, I, I can appreciate how somebody who is in a creative field might feel um, anxious about the ability of being replaced. We were just talking about that a moment ago. But I think that if we embrace these tools as a way for us to either be infinitely more creative or better at our jobs, right, um, to augment what we're doing, because, you know, the emotion and the like human connection and all of the things that that make us like truly human go into creativity. Right. And that's where, you know, a a feeling comes when you're, when you're watching a film, like a person is responsible for that. Um, And we're a long way away from a machine being able to do that. Right. So that we're always going to need people, but equally the amount of time that we spend on mundane monotonous stuff that can be replaced um, with tools that AI offers so that gives you more time to do things where you can really add meaningful material value to what you do. I think it's just a perspective. But going back to, to Eric's point, which I think is interesting, um, or, or, or sort of uh, going back to the, the vision of, of the firm as he outlined it. And I think you guys would argue, I'm going to, I'm going to present what I think your argument would be, which is it's less that the technology itself is inherently uh, scary or, or opens the door to, um, you know, some dystopian future. It's when it is solely controlled by one large, you know, tech, uh, monopoly. That's when, that's when we run into issues, right? If it is Google or whomever controlling the entire, uh, network as it were, that's when you run into an issue or where we could run into issues. Yeah. And it would never just be uh, Google that was in charge of it because to say Google is in charge of it is actually to mean that the U S government is in charge of it. Um, I'm not so scared of Google because I can just not use it, but um, the U S government will actually like murder people that it doesn't like. So that's a much more um, worrying outcome for me. I think like AI is clearly very powerful and is going to change society. That's a given. Uh, I worry more about the control it allows to be put not in the hands of machines, but in the hands of humans. Humans humans have been the threat to other humans. Um, And while we can be fearful that AI might be a threat at some point, empirically it has not been thus far, Uh, but humans have. And um, it's going to be a it's going to be a bummer if we are fearful of machines which haven't hurt anyone, and we give a bunch of power to humans uh, to to respond to that, and the humans then have the power to hurt people again. You know, like that's to, to me that's the much more obvious danger. It's interesting because we've seen um, the extent to which the government has not been keen to see money decentralized. Um, of course, yeah. Over the course of, you know, since we all been in this industry, um, you know, choke, uh, choke point, um, 2.0 is evidence of that, um, from the crypto side, there's, there's really not, you can only imagine that the attempt to decentralize AI will only follow a similar course. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the major difference is that like money is something that the government has been used to controlling for a hundred ish years. Um, and everyone believes that government should control money. Well, crypto well not people everyone. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, normies do. Normies all think that governments should control money. Uh, they don't even understand that a, an alternative could exist. Um, AI is newer in that uh, no one's used to controlling it. The government's not used to controlling AI for the last century, right? Like this is a new phenomenon of the last half decade, um, at least in the popular consciousness. And uh, so that struggle for control has a different characteristic um, than the, the one in, in money. Mm. But I think, gov you know, governments are going to control everything that they can. So they, they still have that same impetus. I don't know if you saw that meme on Twitter. It's like that classic, you know, um, guy at a party. They don't know that I'm, do you know what meme I'm talking about? I don't know. They don't know that I'm whatever. Uh, someone posted, uh, that meme with like the EU, um, uh, insignia on the one guy. It's like, they don't know that I'm coming up with the best like AI regulation. And then it's like, you know, meta and open AI and they all have like American flags underneath them. And it's like, okay, do you really EU have the best regulation? Um, give us a, give us a breakdown of like how these different governments are maybe trying to plant their flag or approaching it. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there have been, um, some of it comes from precedent, right? So, I mean, if we look at the EU, it is, um, I think for most of your listeners, um, going to come as no surprise that the EU um, is is fast to regulate, right? They're, they're always going to be first. And everyone's going to fall in line because they've solved it. And everyone's going to have to acquiesce because if you want to serve Europe, then you're going to have to um, comply with these EU rules. Um, and Straight away, actually, as soon as that AI Act went into effect, the actual author of the bill um, posted on Twitter that they were concerned that they had gone too far, right? So this is the MEP saying, you know, we got this wrong before before any of this happened. This is, I don't know, six, eight weeks ago. Um, so I think what I find incredibly compelling is you now have people, you have a tangible thing that people in the EU don't get, can't have, right? Because, you know, the powers of B in Brussels have decided that they're going to put these strict um, restrictions. Now, in the U.S., um, we have existing legislation, um, namely Section 230, which basically enables tech companies to avail themselves to, you know, our, our constitutional right to free speech, right? And that those platforms aren't going to be held responsible for what people say on their platforms. And so it's there's a little bit more friction there for the U.S. government if they wanted to, to come out with some federal package around hey, how AI should be regulated, right? But we've seen some stuff happen at the state level. Um, in California, looks like, you know, they're readying to pass a bill that um, is not great for open source AI, um, and I think if that happens, what's going to happen potentially in the U.S. is that you're going to have other states, much like with crypto, um, like Wyoming, for example, turn around and say, nope, that doesn't apply here. But, you know, the, California becomes then the EU. And then Californians are going to say, hey, look, this is garbage. We don't want this. Right. Um, and then you have other jurisdictions like the U.K. that have been um, very upfront about hey, we want to embrace AI. We want this to be part of, um, you know, a growing economy. We, you know, want to be responsible about this. We should think about it, but actually have put nothing down on paper, which is a very UK thing to do. Because I think that they recognize that there's a lot we don't know yet. And so to act quickly, um, you kind of end up in this bucket that the EU is in. So I, I, I think that there is going to be um, a bit of slow rolling on, on AI. And I think that open source, um, much like crypto, is a smaller community um, that is pretty self-sufficient and is not one of these, you know, tech conglomerates that is already spending a lot of money lobbying for their positions, right? Um, and so they're kind of an easy target. Would you say that the positioning that's um, where we are right now is is benefiting or serving more non-open source AI relative to open source. Yeah. 
I, I, I would. Um, and that just comes from the fact that. And do you reckon that that's because they just, they, they, they sort of can't gronk the, they view it as, you know, monolithic versus. I don't like, think they have a choice. They don't have a choice, Frank. So if you look at meta or, you know, open AI, maybe to less extent, but somebody like Microsoft, you know, is, is, is obviously a partner with them. Apple, you know, these are regulated companies. They're public companies in the U.S. And so if they chose to just say, hey, we're just going to, you know, ride the wave and do what we're going to do. And, you know, you can't touch these AI activities. I don't think the U.S. government's going to let them do that. It's a much mm. more difficult conversation. For, for users, I think I would hope everyone listening has, has you know, experimented with generative AI, but how does, how does open source, an open source permissionless architecture manifest into a user experience? Like what, what would people expect um, differently than a non-open source approach? In just like asking a very basic question. Um, well, someone can test that real quickly by take uh, some kind of controversial question, go to ChatGBT, ask it, see how it responds. Go to venice.ai, ask the same question, see how it responds. Uh, you'll probably immediately see a difference. And um, that difference is because we're not putting all sorts of like censorship and guardrails on a human's ability to interact with machine intelligence. Um, what do those guardrails actually look like? Like internally at, um, you know, we don't have to pick on anyone in particular, but what what are they programming into it that sets these parameters that result in, you know, me not letting, or, or it, me not being able to render an image of uh, Kamala Harris hugging Donald Trump? Yeah, um, they have some kind of rule in their in their, you know, programming that says, uh, do not render um, politicians or, you know, like, I don't know how explicit they are about which names or, or, or what, but they have rules that prevent their system from generating an image, which it's perfectly capable of generating. Uh, so it's not a deficiency of their technology. Their technology could absolutely do it. It's humans that are like, oh, we don't think um, our customers should be able to generate an image of a politician. And you get these absurd outcomes. Like several months ago, we posted an image generated on Venice of Biden and Trump having tea. And it was just like this cute little funny image. And you can't do it with OpenAI. You can't do it with MidJourney. Anthropic doesn't do images at all. But um, like, wh why in the world would, you, would anyone accept or believe it's appropriate that a, a content policy would disallow even an innocuous image like this? Uh, so there, there's just, there's something wrong there. And like these, these large companies, they have many problems that they're worried about, many challenges. They don't currently care. I don't think they don't care about the censorship side. They don't want to offend people. They don't want to get in trouble. So they just put up all sorts of guardrails because they don't want to deal with that stuff. Um, I come from like a very different, different ethos. Like Tina and I are from the crypto world. Like we, we've emerged out of this world where the, the sanctity and sovereignty of the individual is like a fundamental principle that we care about. And we're not going to be paternalistic and tell people what they can and can't do. So um, it's just like a different culture. And um, I, don't, I don't think that the big companies need to adopt our culture. Like it's perfectly fine for them to set whatever guardrails in their systems they want. That's, that's totally cool. But we're going to uh, build an alternative and people in the marketplace can make their decisions. To, to be sure, right? On the, on the flip side, the lack of any guardrails can open the door to um, potentially uh, harmful outcomes. How do you reconcile that? I think in the realm of speech, it's actually hard to argue that like anything that a machine says to you is harmful. Right? Like make, make the case that it's harmful. I think it's just speech. It might be highly distasteful. It might be rude, might be offensive. Um, something could be like racist or bigoted or, or just like distasteful for all sorts of reasons. Is that harm? 
No, I think I, I hold harm as like a different kind of, different kind of thing. Um, and I, I think that when people start retreating from open speech, the, the harm that you prevent from like the dangerous words is way outdone by the harm that caused by, by restricting how people can communicate with each other. Um, so I think that's a much bigger danger. Let me be clear. We um, don't censor the outputs of, of, you know, text chat or code or, or, or images. Um, but you can't create illegal content on Venice either. Right. So if, if something is illegal um, and, and we can all in our mind's eye, imagine what those things might be, that is not something that you're able to create on Venice. Um, and again, going back to open source models, we're only able to um, provide access to the models as they were published, right? And so um, what happens in some of these closed models are that the, the model is generated and then these additional safety filters go on top. And those might be things like, um, don't offend anyone. I mean, sometimes it's it's very simple. Don't say anything that could be considered offensive. Or if you go back a few months to um, when Gemini launched and you could only get pictures of black Vikings because a person had decided that we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to offend anyone. And so we were going to return pictures of people of color with, you know, prompts that obviously didn't make any sense. There aren't or weren't any black Vikings. Um, so... But if you're asking for something that is illegal, then then those models aren't going to produce them. And, and, and there's nothing that we're doing that is necessarily um, preventing that. Although, you know, we do have some controls in place to, to ensure that people aren't using Venice to do illegal activity. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure maybe there was maybe one Black Viking that could have been. Well, maybe, maybe yes. Maybe just Indeed, one. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, that was so strange. Um, and I feel like that's like the flip side of like what maybe people might be worried about open source is they're trying so hard to like embed a narrative or a social construct into the way this AI works. And you're trying to effectively like let it just do its thing within, I mean, there are some parameters, it sounds like, you know, you don't want. Um, like, um, think, think about like, uh, when search engines launched in the nineties, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, you know, and maybe some people disagree with this, but in my opinion, fortunately, uh, they didn't really restrict what you could search for. Like you could search for nearly anything, including lots and lots of distasteful things. Um, still can. You still can. Uh, yeah. still can. And that's a different culture in the nineties that permitted that than the one we have today where these AIs are, uh, put, put under such guardrails, like in, in pretty restrictive stuff to the point of absurdity. Um, and you're, you're right. Like the, the creators of many of these tools are trying to impose their worldview into the recipients because they think, they think they know what's right and they want to like mandate that on everyone. That's a, a very different, I think, ethos than how the search engines evolved in the early 90s. Well, this gets into an interesting topic that um, I don't know if you guys listen to All In, um, that podcast with, uh, you know, Kraft and Galifianakis, uh, or Kalkana, Jason, Jason, um, where they were discussing... Um, if you try to search for anything Trump related on Google, only pro Kamala Harris articles crop up. Yeah. Um, so we see these sort yeah, of that mitigates actually what I'm saying is like yeah. even that culture is seeping into even Google now. Yeah. Whereas like I don't think any, any no one would have believed no in the nineties or when Google came out, you know, like two thousand or whatever, they would have never done that kind of thing back then. Yeah. And I don't know the extent to which I, I can't speak to the veracity of sort of that, like thinking, but, um, I mean, I, I think I tried it once and it, 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 it at least in that anecdotal, uh, case, uh, stood to be true, 
I think like the pool of people who are like concerned maybe about their search or their like generative AI um, uh, outcomes being distorted in some way. Th- th- there's a group of people who care about that, but I think maybe more people care about like their privacy and their data and their, and their sovereignty. Right. Um, and we've you actually know, seen the opposite. Oh, really? Yeah. So we, we have, you know, basically like two, two pitches for Venice. One is that it's private and that none of your conversations are stored or seen by Venice, which makes it wholly unique from a anthropic or a open AI. Um, but two, so the privacy is one side and the, the second is the lack of censorship. We kind of like lead with both of those two things. And we found that people are emotionally much more affected by the censorship side. Like they, that's the one that causes them to have a visceral reaction where they're like, oh, this is cool. And they, they're like, they, they, they're cheerful about what Venice is doing because of the censorship side way more than the privacy side. And I think that's because like, like um, if you, if you use Venice and it's private, you don't feel anything different, right? Like a privacy only kind of matters when, when a dangerous problem happens, like if it gets hacked and then, then you start feeling exposed. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. That kind of thing. Whereas when it comes to like the censorship, it's a present danger or present um, thing that you can observe. So we've just noticed anecdotally that many more people seem affected by that side. I, yeah, that's fair. I guess maybe I'm just projecting, um, you know, the, the, what, what's the but expression? But I also think, Frank, most people don't even necessarily realize. No, they don't. Um, that's what I'm saying. I mean, what's the yeah, expression? It, you know, it, show it show me like a man's it. diary and his checkbook and I'll tell you everything you need to know about a man. Now it's show me what he's putting into chat GBT and uh, you but, but you you hit the nail on the head. I use that analogy a lot. So when people use social, I think they have this expectation. We understand we're the product. We're giving them this information about us, and then we're being fed advertising and things are we being get curated. That trade off. Everybody gets it. Yeah. And and so it, it's become acceptable. But would you? So when you think about the context, your Instagram, for example, whether it be private or open to the public is the curated version of you. I'm putting on Instagram what I want people to see about my life, right? And whatever context that is. There's a very different proposition than putting my diary or my journal online so that everybody can read it. My most private thoughts, things I struggle with, things I'm exploring. Like this is very personal. It's a very personal experience. I genuinely don't believe that people understand when they're putting information into these closed source models that one, it's being used to train their models. Two, the outputs are not proprietary, they're, they're, they're not your IP. So if you create an image and you take it away, like it's, it actually belongs to somebody else, it's not yours. Um, and that a person potentially can be sitting on the other side of that and seeing you know, a downloaded CSV file of all of the prompts that went in that day, and they can read through that. And most importantly, it's not just that they see your prompts, they know they're yours. They're attached to your identity, and as Eric says, forever, right? So maybe you don't care about it today. It's a bit like a tattoo. You think, oh, this tattoo is a good idea, and you have this whole experience, and then 20 years later, you're like, I wish I didn't have this tattoo. 20 years from now, the machines are going to know way more about us because we've given them all this information than maybe we even know about ourselves. I know. And it's so, so, it's I so think bad. It's not tangible, and people don't get it. It's so well, that, bad. To build on that a little bit, like the, those who are fearful of AI because of like the evil, the evil super intelligence idea, um, those people should be extra concerned about the privacy question, right? Because if you think that like a super sinister Terminator type uh, AGI is going to come out in the future and be a risk to humanity, they're going to be um, a bigger risk what, if you have no safeguards you, around your privacy. Yeah. Uh, like, what do you think that AI is going to do? Like, it's going to learn about the humans it's trying to subjugate, right? And what's in four years from now or 10 years from now or whenever that happens, like, what is the, what database is it going to go after? What database knows more about you than you, right? It's your, it's your Gmail. It's your open AI history. It's these centralized databases of your communications, which it will be able to parse with a super intelligence and understand exactly who you are and how to manipulate you. 
And the only defense to that is if that data does not exist in the first place, right? The, the, this, the evil AGI does not care about OpenAI's terms of service. It's not going to like not open up your files because the, the terms say not to, right? Like the data cannot be there or else it will be used um, by human hackers or nefarious agents or some kind of horrible AGI in the future. That the privacy thing needs to be taken seriously by people. And um, in, in Venice's case, the information is just never stored. So we don't see your prompts, we don't store them, and we don't see the responses either. I might have to start using it. I'm, I'm getting a bit afraid just thinking about how many. I, I, I put, <laughs> sure. I put through, I Good, put then through, you're I, thinking. I, I, oh. Well, I, I'll try not to hurt myself, but uh, I don't. I use it a lot to um, feel like via email I can come off with clients uh, a bit terse and too frank. So I'll put through an email and say, hey, make this sound more polite. <laughs> but it's... That's it's out. That's not mine anymore. Like that's what I think people don't really fully appreciate. Yeah. Well, and any anyone who's using private data that they're doing analyses on, like if you're a law firm, uh, you have certain legal obligations, but also just ethical obligations of privacy. Um, I guarantee you, there are a lot of lawyers using ChatGPT, kind of ignoring that point, which is yeah. that like all of their private communications with their clients. And all that information is going into OpenAI servers forever. Yeah. And it's not theirs. I think the other thing to consider too, um, you know, we are talking about a very um, thoughtful decision to use Claude or mm -hmm. ChatGPT or Venice, right? Um, and I think that some of these companies um, as Eric said, aren't necessarily worried about those things right now. They're worried about other things. Um, and, and that's fair, but there are also companies that I think do acknowledge that they're potentially, you know, scraping data, um, and don't tell you about it. And so the, there is the, that the fact that they don't tell you that they're doing it outwardly and you kind of have to find out on your own. Um, last week, uh, LinkedIn turned on this, um, you, you were automatically opted in to be able for LinkedIn to basically scrape everything in your profile. So all of your direct messages, all of your posts, all of your comments, they're going to scrape that into their uh, AI system. Um, Slack tried to do, or they, they do do, um, something similar. I don't know, that was probably two or three months ago. Um, and so instead of sending, you know, the account manager an email saying, hey, we're going to turn this on on such and such a date. And if you don't want it on, turn it off. They just opt everybody in and you have to figure out that it's happening and opt out. So that to me feels a little subversive, right? And, and, and almost an acknowledgement that um, your data is being used and you're not necessarily being told about it. And so those types of things just make me very nervous and I don't like it. So, so if you're not, if you're not storing the data, um, you know, users can opt to keep, um, <clears throat> there's, there's this data sovereignty el element. Um, what, how does that impact sort of the, uh, the models learning and sort of, uh, you know, building on, you know, the universe of, 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 of uh, user information? Um, in Venice, we are not building models. We, we expose or we enable people to access, you know, at any time, several of the top open source models. Uh, those models are all pre-trained and then they exist mm -hmm. in somewhat of a static state from that point. Uh, so us not knowing anything about the user's prompts or responses doesn't um, help or hinder the model itself. It's just, it exists independently of it. Oh, I see. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and for now you guys are operating on like a, uh, it's a subscription sort of situation, um, from a monetization standpoint. Yep. $49 a year. You get a pro account. Easy peasy. <laughs> Lemon squeezy. Um, I mean, we've seen all the headlines in terms of valuations and, uh, obviously the big news with Sam kind of, you know, taking control over everything. Um, 
What's the what's the business opportunity? We haven't really talked much about like we we've talked about a lot of the ideas that are uh, shaping the discourse in this this category. But as a business, like what is walk us through the plan? Like how do we how do we build this into a um, a big thing? Well, unlike cryptocurrency, which I think has the potential to be a mass market product and we'll get there with time has certainly been a slow going. That's far bigger than it, than it was 10 years ago, but it's not mass market yet. Um, AI generative AI specifically kind of broke onto the scene instantly mass market, right? Like open AI was, or chat GPT specifically was like the fastest growing consumer product of all time. Um, so from that perspective, it's nice. Like, uh, Venice uh, can and does cater to like the to the majority of that same kind of user base. So hundreds of millions of users are potentially uh, customers right away. Um, so in that you know it's it's nice to be able to build something which is which has as its um, potential you know numbers and hundreds of millions of users, if not billions. Also, I will say. And this is something we even internally are trying to train ourselves on, which is like, uh, yeah, there's 8 billion humans, um, but there will be agents that are AI entities, like AI agents that exist on the internet of varying levels of autonomy, uh, varying complexity. Uh, those agents can be customers too, which is like a weird thing to think about. Um, well, I don't think a lot of people think about the extent to which like AI agents will like play a role in the economy. Yeah. Like they're going to, you know, if I contribute X to GDP, Frank will have 10 agents that create an order of magnitude more contribution to the economy. And they could all have their own bank accounts and their own like, um, well, not bank accounts. They can have crypto accounts. Not bank accounts, crypto accounts, but they'll have their own sort of like wallets, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, they probably, yeah. It'll be hard for them to get a Bank of America account, but they'll all like be contributing to like this commerce that exists. Totally. Almost like a game, like, like you know, you can think of it like RuneScape, right? Like, you know, I've yeah. got my little guy out there chopping wood and, and you know, getting some iron and... Um, yep. Yeah, there will be like there will be little little autonomous that. robots, and some of them not so little, which at some point may comp may constitute like the majority of economic transactions in the world may end up being AI agents. That won't be a year. And that now. happens by when, Eric? Like probably sooner than we like, think. Uh, yeah, I mean that's an interesting one. Like when will um, when will AI agents be the be the majority of Earth? Uh, economic commerce, I would say like five to 20 years, like in that kind of time frame. Um, but we, so Venice will have an API soon. And, you know, the, like the main customer of the API uh, at first will probably be other humans, but at some point might be AIs themselves. Um, and because we're building this to be like much more crypto native, um, hopefully we can attract the X number of crazy AI agents that are coming. And we need to think about those as our potential customer, you know, like how do you make a sales brochure for an AI agent? You know, we, we, uh, this is. Well, not only that, but like, I mean, I mean, like, like thinking about biz dev for AI, AI agents is probably like one of the less thorny questions to tackle, like, what do their rights look like? You know, what, what, you know, who controls the, the economic sort of, um, value that they bring? Is it, is it them or is it, you know, who, where, where does the ownership lie? I, th I think there, there's going to be a period where humans have the hubris to think that we can control that. Um, and then there's going to be the period afterward where humans realize they can't. You know, and it's like, imagine if uh, if monkeys or chimpanzees or something like created humans um, and they, for some period of time, they were trying to figure out like, how should humans be governed? Um, 
they would be so inferior in their intelligence to us that there'd be this period of time where the, where the apes believed that they could design how humans would interact. But humans, of course, would come along and do their own thing. Um, and I think AI agents will be, will be like that. And that's a totally weird and kind of scary future, but it also seems pretty inevitable. The timing is unclear, but um, the direction of that as technological advancement on Earth seems pretty, pretty clear to me. And why shouldn't we stop that? Why shouldn't we? We can't. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the answer. We, we cannot. We could delay it. We could slow it down. Uh, we, can't, we can't stop that from happening. Like, and this, this is a beautiful aspect of humanity. Like humanity always will try to build and grow and advance and become more, a more complex society. That cannot be stopped. That, that phenomenon cannot be stopped with humans. And so that, that must lead to machine intelligence becoming like the dominant form of intelligence. Um, and we cannot, what we can do is hope that it is benevolent or, or mutually compatible with humans. Um, I think a lot of the people that fear that it's going to destroy humans and be evil are anthropomorphizing machines who will not have the same tribal biases that we evolved with. So there's, you know, if you're an, if you're an optimistic person, there's reason to believe that it could become like an absolutely beautiful future. Um, but I understand someone who might also be like totally terrified of it. And we're, we're going to see it. You know, like this is like not a hundred years from now, this is stuff that's going to happen all in our lifetimes. Yeah, I, th I think that like, you know, it's a lot of the thinking around this like kind of is uh, tainted or distorted by Hollywood and movies, yeah, the movies first, yeah, and yeah. stuff. Yeah. And like, you know, the, the whole trope of like, well, the machines are obviously going to realize that like the most dangerous things to humans are humans. So they need to they need to all be removed. Um, yeah, I would guess it. I would guess it ends up more like how humans evolved vis-a-vis uh, -vis like apes like um humans have certainly harmed and hunted and killed some degree of the ape population um but an equilibrium developed like humans humans aren't going around trying to exterminate apes uh in fact like we have kind of the opposite bias where we try no, to we're trying to protect them, them. yeah yeah trying to protect them like um so it's not a we think they're cute we haven't been we haven't been perfectly benevolent with apes, but we're also not evil about it. Um, I think it's reasonable to think that robots and machine intelligence could end up in the same thing. They, they, they may well hurt and kill people um, through accident or through maliciousness occasionally, but that doesn't mean we should assume that like all machine intelligence is going to have this idea of exterminating humans. It's like, we don't care to do that with apes. Why, why not? Um, they're not a threat to us. And it's actually kind of cool to have them around. Yeah, they are pretty cool. But I actually think that this is another um, example of the perils of, you know, one of the things I used to say when, you know, people would ask me about um, crypto regulation and, you know, all the protections that we put in place um, so that, you know, people don't get hurt right, financially. Um, and I said at a conference once and people kept bringing it up, that I didn't want to be protected into staying poor, right? So all of these, you know, guardrails around, like, I, I want the ability to be able to exponentially increase my wealth if, if you know, it fits within my risk appetite and all of these protections that are there to keep me safe actually just keep me poor, right? Um, and the poorest of us, I think, are subjected to that even more so, right? So, for example, um, you you don't get a savings account, you don't get a good credit limit um, or a good interest rate on a credit card. You know, all of these things like you know keep poor people poor. So, with machine learning, if we are exposing ourselves to this curated, adulterated, you know, safety version of the the availability of knowledge that comes with raw machine learning, then you're keeping people kind of stupid, right? So then the same way that we're keeping people poor. Um, and I think that over time, especially if Eric is right, that is to our detriment, right? Like 
I want my parents and my nieces and nephews and, you know, everybody I know to feel comfortable with this technology. Going back to your first question, don't be afraid of it. Learn how to use it and and really kind of go deep in your understanding around what those implications might be and how you can use it to your benefit. And if you are in a situation where a machine, supposedly a machine, is telling you, um, not only can you, uh, will I not answer your question, but really you shouldn't be asking that question. You shouldn't be yeah. thinking about that. Don't worry your pretty little head. Like that's control. That's not intelligence. Yeah, we have we have this term mansplaining. We need like a AI splaining or something, right? Yeah. Like this, like really p- paternalistic um, speaking down to you from the machine to the humans. Well, hopefully uh, that's what we avoid. Yeah, we sh- we should avoid that. But the the machines aren't doing that. The machines aren't imposing that on us. It's us at some of these companies putting in these like guardrails because they don't want to offend anyone that you just end up with this like paternalistic machine intelligence, which is. Why do you think we've become as a society so afraid of offending each other? When at, at a very like micro level, like I know anyone listening and all three of us, we have best friends and good friends. And what do we do to them to show up, show them that we love them is we make fun of them and we razz them. Yeah. And, but for some reason at this macro level, like it has become so, it just, it's become so just dis, distasteful, I guess. I think um, for at least for those, for people in the relatively wealthy West, life is extremely comfortable by all historical standards. And so we're looking for something. And, and people do not deal with, I'm generalizing, of course but many people do not deal with real struggle in the way that they used to. Hmm. And, and humans adapt to their environment and you still have the same mechanisms in your mind looking for danger. And so the, a society that becomes so comfortable from, from like, you know, real problems or real struggles. A lion eating you. Invents new ones, invents new ones. And, and suddenly, you know, when, I, when I'm not worried about a, a tribe coming over and like um, killing me, and I'm just sitting comfortably with plenty of calories all the time. Um, oh, now if you come over and say something I don't like, like that same mechanism in the brain is like, that's now the thing that bothers me because my mm. brain has reset to a comfortable environment. And I, I think a lot of it is just that people live such comfortable lives now that they don't realize that like words are not violence ever. They're just not, they're just words. And uh, it's, a, it's a sad development of society, I think, and not a, not a healthy one. Mm. Well said. Good, good for us to chew on. Um, <laughs> Tina, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Why do I think that we've become so sensitive? I don't know. Um, this has taken quite the detour. I think people are too sensitive these days. Is personally my opinion, but I, I honestly, there. So I am an American that hasn't lived in the U.S. for a long time. Um, and so I do, um, you know, have a, a shared experience of of being, you know, raised and indoctrinated as as an American patriot, um, and then have lived elsewhere um, for the majority of my adult life. So there is cultural dynamic um, at play here as well, right? So the whole mm. idea around making fun of each other, and in the UK you would say taking the piss, and um, it is an art form, right? Um, and it, when I first moved here, ironically, I remember saying to my husband, why are people so mean? Why do they want to like make people, their friends feel small? Like this is really aggressive. And he thought I was nuts. He was like, what are you talking about? Like, this is an expression of love and appreciation for, (laughs) you know, your, your dearest. Um, and it was odd to me. So I think there are cultural mechanisms. If you go, there are definitely European countries and I'm not going to call any of them out, but, um, have a very kind of similar approach. Um, and then if you kind of go further afield, again, I think there is a socioeconomic, um, context as well. Um, but then you have cultures that you would, you know, if you look at like the Japanese culture, for example, incredibly reverent, right? Very um, mm. focused on those outside of myself, right? So, you know, I wear a mask because I'm sick, not because I don't want to get sick, like those types of, of things, like long before COVID, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I do think that um, 
some of the things that we're seeing, I notice more so um, in the U.S. than I notice when I'm outside of the U.S. Um, and honestly, I, I think um, that that Eric's right, right? The, the limbic part of your brain and the fight or flight and the parasympathetic nerve reaction that you have mm. to things is an innate part of of yeah, they don't want to be on a flight. Yeah. That, that um, is part of so, it. Yeah, like you've the, the, your your hyper vigilance is on and so you're you're looking for things. I don't know. I have four brothers and no sisters. I like to say I'm unoffendable. Um there are very few things that that bother me to the point where I'm actually going to get like upset. So, you know, maybe it's a, a predisposition. We're just not, you know, we're not as hardy as we used to be. I don't know. Yeah, tough yeah. times make for uh, weak AI agents. I guess we, we'll see if that that becomes the case. Um, okay, so what should folks expect out of you guys over the next uh, you know six months? Obviously, this is fast evolving, um, but but you know, open up the kimono if you would. Uh, so yeah, right right now you can use Venice for normal text chat, for image generation, and for code generation. Um, on website, like from your computer and from a mobile, from your uh, from your phone, um, so that will feel very much like a like a basic chat GPT experience. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like we're working on our API, which will allow people to algorithmically interact with the system. So this is more relevant to software developers, uh, but they will be able to build their own apps that pull from Venice's models um, and generate images or, or text in an uncensored private way. Um, so that's kind of our main focus in the, in the near term. And then just really like keeping up with the pace of development. So we're, we're constantly changing models, like new open source models are everywhere. And we have to figure out which ones we want to balance and provide, and we don't want to make it too complicated, but not limit too many options. So it's, it's like, it is an ecosystem that's evolving even faster than crypto, which is a uh, quite a high bar. Uh, so we're just trying to stay up to speed on that and keep delivering, you know, like a good quality experience at scale. Yeah. I, I think, you know, commercially too, we're seeing a lot of interest from, um, companies, um, who, uh, you know, like law firms, for example, we were talking about, um, schools, you know, how, how, how do you protect, you know, kids data? How do you ensure that it's their information is going to be used to train models? And we're like, well, we don't have it, so we don't have to protect it. So, you know, you can click in your own authorization uh, mechanism and just go straight into Venice um, and not have to worry about any of that stuff. And that's quite compelling for um, institutions that have that really high bar of confidentiality or don't want to have their IP leaked. So we're seeing a lot of interest um, from from that type of user. Um, and obviously the API will, will help with that. Um, but we are also uh, looking to just really make Venice like the best experience that it can be. So, you know, it has a sleek interface. Um, it's very simple and easy to use. So if you're having an experience in Venice, you tell us you don't like something. I mean, literally, we our users tell us something and we change it that day or the next day. Um, and I think that our users have been very surprised by how responsive and um, adaptive we can be based on that feedback. And so we're really very user kind of driven in our development. Um, another thing that we're working on that I think is very cool um, are, are pre-designed um, and the ability to design your own persona, um, which has a number of use cases. Um, the one that I like to think about because I fancy myself one day writing a book um, and the I've started and stopped a couple of times. And it's usually around like dialogue, right? It's hard to put yourself in the mind of somebody else because you're you, right? And you might have three or four characters in a book. So if you could create personas for each of those characters and you're an author and you get stuck and you're like, what would Eric say to Frank in this situation? Then you can just like literally have your characters have a conversation. Yeah. I've always wondered that in books, yeah. like when, you know, people are able to recall exactly what was said. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there are just so many cool things that you can do, um, with, with personas, um, that is a completely separate experience of using this tool than me having a conversation, um, with Venice. So those are some of the things that we're, that we're working on at the moment that, 
people might be interested in. Amazing. Yeah. Um, well, where can people find find more information? Where can they find you? Uh, you know, if they want to reach out or um, Venice.ai. Uh, go to Venice.ai, download it on your phone, and um, that's that's number one. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, et cetera, but um, just use it. You can use it for free. You don't even need an account. You can just go, try it out, and uh, if you like it, then we'll uh, we'll keep building a, a service basically in, um, in defense of free speech and privacy. And sadly, that's like kind of a niche these days, but it's an important niche that we're going to fill. Amazing. And if you try it and you like it, but you don't love it, tell us why. Um, yeah, perfect. I mean, you can see Eric engage with people on Twitter all the time where he's like, <laughs> tell me why. And they tell him and then the next day we fix it. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining the program. Thanks, Frank. It's been Thanks, great. Frank. Thank you so Cheers. much.